What I want to talk about is a powerful force that is contributing to the transformation of Africa and African cities. Borrowing from the work of Asif Bayat is what I call quiet encroachment. I want to start off with this uh, picture here, which is a community in Lilongwe, Malawi, which is using its own energy, its own muscle power, its own creativity, and its own resources to build a neighborhood in the absence of anybody else doing it for them, neither the state or business. Before I explain this project a little bit further, we need to put it in, the, in, the, in, in context. Africa is being transformed by the second urbanization wave. The first urbanization wave really was from 1750 to 1950 and resulted in 400 million people landing up in cities in the developed world. Between 1950 and 2030, we have the second urbanization wave, which is going to result in the urbanization of nearly 4 billion people that are going to land up in cities in, in the developing world, especially in Asia and Africa. We're 6 billion people on the planet now. We're going to, going up to 9. The next 3 billion are going to land up basically in cities in Africa and Asia. Now, Africa is in an interesting transition moment. Roughly 40% of Africa, uh, of Africa is, is urbanized, but it's projected to rise to 60% by 2050. What that means is that the roughly 370 million people who currently live in cities in Africa is going to increase by 800 million to 1.2 billion people. Another 800 million people living in African cities in the next couple of decades. More concerning, though, is that if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, roughly 62% of urban dwellers live in slums. That's the highest proportion in the world. So if you compare that to Southern Asia, which is roughly 43%, West Asia, about 24%, Latin American, Caribbean, around 27%. So it's, it's a very high proportion. So that's why we talk about uh, a fairly unique phenomenon in Africa, slum cities, urbanization without industrialization. And this, is, this, this has particularly significant implications for everyday life. Basically, the key condition for survival in African cities is flexibility, the ability to learn and learn very quickly in the blink of an eye as context shifts uh, unexpectedly. Now, that capability is giving rise to a completely different set of identities. My concern is that these are not really being understood. We have African governments who, on the whole, live in denial about sl slum urbanism. African governments, uh, there isn't an African government with a decent urban development policy, even in South Africa. And on the whole, the underlying rationale is, well, the, the reason we have slums is these people uh, don't belong there. They should go back to where they came from. Uh, and the, the kind of underlying, I think, logic is that somehow rural dwellers have irrationally come to the conclusion that they're going to survive better in cities than in the rural areas. Now, there's a very different... Uh, discourse that's beginning to emerge from some of the mainstream economic... Uh, a good example uh, would be uh, the McKinsey report on the growth prospects uh, for, for Africa. This report depicts um, uh, uh, African cities as the melting pots for a new propel and drive uh, uh, African economic development in the future. Now, what you have is these two different logics, the melting pot of coal for the new consumers and the, the, the irrational urban dwe the rural dweller that has kind of drifted into the cities and must go home. Now, I think there's a third logic that, it, that emerges from the projects that I'm going to be talking about now. The idea of the co-producer, the idea of the quiet encroacher that really is, is really looking for a way of co-producing their urban environments and, and the city of the future uh, with, with other stakeholders. Now, the, the two projects I want to look at here, starting off uh, in the first instance uh, with, uh, with Kibera, well -known, uh, a well-known place in Africa, one of the largest slums in the world, 800,000 people living in highly congested conditions. They have a system here called flying toilets. If you want to do your business, you wait until nightfall, you do it in a bag, and you then swing it. When I was in Kibera, I came across this march through the, through the 
through the through the, through Kibera suburb, if I can call it that, uh, the Kibera community, and it's a march of women holding up pictures of the houses that they would like to build. Now I'm a I'm a I'm an I'm a I'm an aging South African activist, and when I see a march, I look behind me and say, where are they going? Who they're going to make their demands to? Who they're confronting? Who's running away from them? That's not what's happening in Kibera, I soon find out. These guys weren't marching against anyone, to anyone. They were marching against hopelessness. They were marching to raise the possibility that tomorrow could be a better day. They're organized by an international network, Shack Dwellers International, which has federations in about 30 uh, developing countries around the world. And they organize, around, uh, they organize women around savings, around the possibility of uh, building their own homes, about negotiating uh, with, with other stakeholders in order to redefine their spaces, to redefine their, their power in, in, the, in the structure of, 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 of society. This woman here was a member of the Kenyan Federation who managed to save enough with her group of, of savers in order to participate in a, in a very interesting housing development which took place after the movement won the security of tenure to the land. But there was a condition. The houses had to be built in exactly the same area where the shack used to be, basically a three-by-four space or even smaller. Now, this was a serious architectural challenge. And Aaron Wegman, the architect who worked with, this, worked, with this, worked with this movement, designed an ingenious three-story structure which was appropriate for people at different phases of their own financial development. If you didn't have enough money, you could just build one floor. If you had, if, if you could, over time, you could build a second floor and a third floor, and at each stage you could use the roof. So this, was a, this is an example of the kind of in to upgrade that made it possible for this community to figure out a completely different way of living within this particular space. The, 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 these are examples or pictures of the kind of activities that they're involved in. And the, 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 example, the picture on the top there is a meeting with the city councillors. Now let me shift to a community in Lilongwe in Malawi where similarly it's a, fit, it's a relatively new federation that is, uh, that is also affiliated to Shack Dwellers International. And here you have a group of women who were living with their families in the backyards, paying rent to landlords, who were also fairly poor. But over time, these rents went up, and it became increasingly difficult for these families to exist there. So what they wanted was a, a, a piece of land. They wanted, if you like, to initiate a greenfield development. They organized, they negotiated with the mayor. I actually attended one of those meetings. And they, the mayor said to them, okay, we'll give you land, but on two conditions. We won't give you anything to build the houses, and we won't do anything about your services. You just get land, nothing else. So they had to figure out a way to do this. The problem is that the traditional uh, skills in the area for building is to use charcoal to fire the bricks. Now, because Malawi has the fastest urbanization rate in Africa, and there isn't an energy infrastructure, that the forests are being cut down, which means uh, charcoal has, has to be transported over longer and longer distances, which is pushing up the price, which in turn has made it, uh, made it impossible for these people to figure out how to make bricks with increasingly expensive charcoal. So they, some of them came over to our eco-village across the road, where we've, been, where we've been building houses with adobe bricks, and we showed them that it is possible to make these bricks dried in the sun and they can perform just as well as the bricks that they were used to. A couple of technical people went up, did a short training course, and they built 800 houses. Now this is the picture of the, of the, of the bricks and, the, and, the, and, the, and gives you a feel of, of the production yard. They used their own local material. And the most incredible and distinctive feature about this movement is the power of singing. He has a group of women on the day that the community hall was opened doing what they always do, no matter what activity, whether they're talking to the mayor, whether they're building their houses, whether they, they are negotiating with officials, they're singing. Singing all the way to the community hall with the, with the different skirts, they're representing different, uh, different identities of different savings groups uh, as, as to celebrate their community. The women do the work, the men stand in the background. And Unfortunately, they consulted an urban designer who didn't understand what they were doing, who gave them a low-density, sprawled out, 
uh, layout with wide streets in a community that doesn't have cars. But the community sorts this problem themselves. They start planting in the road. They start building houses where the, the urban designer said they shouldn't be. And so the community solves the problems. But this is the, the, the picture that really, really uh, took my breath away when I, when I first saw it. I still haven't seen it with my own eyes. It's a double-story adobe brick house, complete with buttresses, concrete ring beams, uh, stone foundations. Uh, the, the modules in the middle are going to be cooler because they're protected from the outside modules. This is five different semi-detached uh, homes connected to one another, leaving in front of them open space for cultivation for food security. Now, this is, this, this is done with very, very little external design input. It's, it's driven by people involved in their own co-production. But this is the picture that one of my students took recently from a community here that really takes this, this idea of the creativity people in these communities very far. This guy has his shack in an illegal settlement, and he's building his house around his shack which creates this extraordinary possibility that we can, we can we, instead of building houses in a separate space to the shack, you build it around the shack. So I want to end off where I live, where you are, and just in case you didn't think you were in Africa, in this beautiful part of Stellenbosch, you are. This is a, a, a community of 6,000 people called Enkaneni, just a stone's throw away from where you are now, where some of our, our students are working. What's interesting... And what I share in common with this community is that our community, the Lyndock Eco Village across the road, was built and co-produced by a community that wanted to build their own space, express their own identity, live in a socially mixed way, and try and figure out what ecological, be sustainable living is all about. All that these people are asking is for the same, the right to co-produce their urban environments. My dream is that we have a TEDx in Stellenbosch in five years' time, we have, we have people speaking here from 50, maybe 100, maybe 500 projects across the continent of Africa that build a pan-African movement of co-producers of the urban environment. Thank you.